So recently an entering Patreon question came up. I heard read that infantry weapons were usually not taken from fallen enemies, not for logistical reasons, but because each weapon has its sound and to avoid invoking friendly fire. Is this true? Are there writings, recommendations on this? Are there known exceptions, even not just at individuals, but at unit level? Was this more of a non-issue prior to Eden 60? Infantry weapons, obviously, as opposed to captured armor. How was it with artillery? So there's a lot of to end back here and I won't answer everything in there. I will mostly focus on the German army in the second world, but because there I have the most knowledge. So first off, a definition. Friendly fire, in casualty reporting, a casualty circumstance applicable to persons killed in action or wounded in action, mistakenly or accidentally by friendly forces actively engaged with the enemy, who are directing fire at hostile forces or what is thought to be a hostile force. See also casualty. Also called fratricide from Latin fratra, meaning brother and side to kill. Another term for this is blue and blue, which is in my opinion sounds far more ridiculous, especially euphemistic than friendly fire. I wonder what George Carlin would say about that one. One key reason for friendly fire is misidentification and for this video we solely will look at this aspect. About one potential origin of that infantry weapons were usually not taken from fallen enemies, not for logistical reasons, but because each weapon has its sound and to avoid invoking friendly fire, might be from the miniseries Generation Kill, which is from what I know accurate in its portrayal of military life and processes. I based this on a video where the guy stated that his military friends seem to really like the series, whereas his civilian friends don't. He assumes it mostly comes down to jargon and missing context. I think he's correct. Additionally, one of the actors in that series actually played himself or a guy from his unit. Not entirely sure here. Anyway, Generation Kill plays during the invasion of Iraq in 2003 and follows a Marine Recon unit. There is a particularly annoying American character that fires a captured Kalashnikov, which sets off quite a lot of alarm bells for his fellow soldiers. Leaving behind the fictional depiction, there's a little doubt that especially in the US there is a major concern about friendly fire. Although it was always a problem, the major public concern seems to go back to Operation Desert Storm in 1991, since in that conflict a high rate of US losses was caused by friendly fire. America's recent combat in the Persian Gulf War brought new attention to an old problem, fratricide, or friendly fire that is. Casualties from US or Allied weapons fired at US or Allied military personnel. 24% of all US combat fatalities in the war were caused by friendly fire. This figure seemed much higher than in previous wars and caused a sudden focus on avoiding fratricide in future wars. Keep in mind that it is noted that the numbers seemed far higher than in previous wars. Previously it was often stated that about 2% of the losses were due to friendly fire. Yet the report argues that this number might be complete hogwash. The high fraction of deaths in the Persian Gulf War due to fratricide was much higher than the normal 2% rate frequently cited in the military literature. Broad-based data on fratricide rates are not available, but the recent review of long extinct casualty service from World War II and the Vietnam War shows that fratricide estimates of 2% are unrealistic and 15-20% to may be the norm, not the exception. Now when it comes to friendly fire, the context is very important. Ok, let us take the US invasion of Iraq in 2003 as depicted in the miniseries. I usually don't use Wikipedia as a source, but in this case it should not matter. The total losses for the coalition forces were about 240 killed and 1000 wounded. So a total of about 1300 killed and wounded in a duration of one month one week and four days. Compare this to the invasion of Okinawa in 1944, where the US had almost 70,000 killed, wounded and missing in action in the duration of two months. So you already see the difference in magnitude there on many levels. As such, the sensitivity toward losses is quite different as well. And keep in mind that US losses in the Second World War are far lower than those from Germany, Japan and especially the Soviet Union. So let us look at German sources. So far, the most extreme quote in German sources I found about friendly fire 
is the following. It is out of a handbook from 1934. Be aware, it is not an official handbook, neither have I found a similar quote anywhere else, but this is from the 7th edition of the book. Infantry is useless, which cannot take a good share of its own artillery fire without losing heart. As you can clearly see, for the author, friendly fire due to artillery fire was basically a given. This seems to be in line with the following. In World War II, the most deadly reported individual incidents of fratricides were the result of bombing of friendly troops by friendly aircraft. Surface to surface fratricide resulted most often from indirect fire weapons, that is, artillery fired at a target that the crews could not see. Yet there are other German sources that reflect a similar attitude during the war. So let us look at the T-34. A while ago I did a video on why the Germans did not copy the T-34 tank. Some people pointed out that friendly fire might have been also a reason. The problem is I did not find a single point of evidence for that. To quote, on November 18th, 1941, the Panzer Special Commission from the Army Weapons Office arrived at the headquarters of the 2nd Panzer Army in Orel. On the basis of the latest combat experience, it was to be clarified which measures should be taken against the absolute superiority of the T-34. The frontline officers suggested that the Russian tank should be rebuilt immediately. The emphasis is on the last sentence. The officers from the front line wanted a copy of the T-34. Meanwhile, the engineers and others opted against the copy. On September 11, 1941, a delegation of German constructors inspected in Kummersdorf the enemy armored vehicles captured during the summer. The experts come to a rather negative judgment about the quality of the Soviet tanks. If anyone should be concerned about friendly fire, it should and would be the frontline officers, not the engineers. Since comments about this issue showed up again and again, I wanted to be sure, so I also asked Dr. Roman Töppel on this matter explicitly, and he answered in an email. I don't think that this fear played a major role. After all, both sides used captured tanks again and again. They had to be well marked accordingly. A particular blade in case are the Finns, who fought to a large extent with Soviet captured weapons. At any rate, I have never encountered this fear. And yes, the date is correct. We already emailed about this in November 2020, since although I don't respond to every comment, if there's a valid point raised, I generally tend to do some asking and checking if possible. This of course does not mean that the Germans had no issue with friendly fire. I came across a few accounts, note since I have read very few war diaries where such incidents might be mentioned more often, the following examples might not be representative and my assumption might be wrong. First, my assumption, it seems generally that concern about friendly fire were mostly it was inter-service related, particularly the army getting hit by the Luftwaffe. So the 4th Panzer Division after the Battle of France, despite proper designation of the forward line, individual friendly bombers attacked friendly troops on several occasions. In the divisional history of the 7th Panzer Division, the following incident during winter 1941 in the Soviet Union is mentioned. The Kampfgruppe was hit mercilessly on the morning of December 4th, when three German bombers greeted kindly bars and unload most of the bomb load directly over Stepanovo. The whole section shoots white flares, but it is already too late. Our planes, realizing the mistake, dropped only the smallest part of the bomb loads on the enemy. Now there might be several reasons for this. One might be that losses due to air attacks might have been seen as more avoidable than losses by artillery fire. Another factor is that unlike other forms of friendly fire, these could be correctly attributed more easily. After all, it's easier to spot the Stuttgart bombing your position than to determine if your body was hit by a Soviet or a German rifle without performing an autopsy. Yet I have two more examples of German sources in which there is no mention of the problem of misidentification. A while ago I did a video on German raid tactics. The document specifies the equipment of the two squads. Squad A with a light machine gun and rifles. Squad B and C each with three submachine guns, a captured automatic rifle and a scoped rifle. In addition plenty of hand grenades, flare pistol. Each squad is equipped with two marching compasses. Notice how only one weapon is mentioned to be a captured rifle, whereas the others are not. Of course, since this was about infiltrating the enemy lines, one could argue it was intentional. But the question is then, 
why not use more captured equipment? My interpretation is that again there was not much concern given about the misidentification for both avoiding friendly fire nor for deceiving the enemy. At least the instructions did not explicitly state so. Additionally using only one capture weapon seems not particularly indicative for deception. Finally in October 1940 the Commission for Artillery created a report with a lot of appendixes. Two of those appendixes covered the foreign and German artillery guns that the Germans would not use and those that they would continue to use. These lists are extensive, but the most important aspect are the comments on when a gun was continued in use. In no case there was any mention of a problem with misidentification. The most often mentioned points were that the gun was too old or available in too low numbers. Let us return to the original question. I heard that infantry weapons were usually not taken from fallen enemies, not for logistic reasons, but because each weapon has its sound and to avoid invoking friendly fire. Is this true? In short, it really depends. Nowadays, in modern well-equipped, supplied and trained armed forces, yes. In that case, the enemy weapon is likely also of lower quality or even a direct hazard as well. Keep in mind gun maintenance. Yet if one looks at World War II and specifically Germany, the situation is very different. For nowadays we are talking about far lower troop now numbers, far better and more expensive equipment and other variables that create situations where friendly fire is, higher con is a higher concern and often make the use of captured weapons not just unnecessary but a problem in itself. For the Germans in World War II not using captured equipment would be a ridiculous proposition. Additionally, Friendly fire losses were more in the acceptable loss category as well. Well, I hope you learned something new. Thank you to Andrew for reviewing the script and thank you to Roman Tappen for answering my question. Thank you to all my supporters on Patreon and Subscribestar. As always, sources are listed in the description. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Thank you for watching and see you next time.